Hey guys, Theo Bean here. Uh, before we get into the video, uh, ultimately when I first started recording these videos, uh, going over all the content that was released from the Final Fantasy 16 gameplay preview, uh, I was just kind of going through them one by one. Ultimately decided I was just going to do everything all together in one video, uh, which is why I'm filming this here. Just to let you know, if there's specific content you specifically want to see from one of the videos, I'm going to include a couple of videos that I watched, uh, and then I'm going to have chapters down below segmented. So if you specifically want to see info on a certain video or piece by a certain creator, uh, whoever that may be, uh, check down below if you specifically want to see that. But just to kind of give you an idea of how this is going to be broken down, starting with IGN first and then just kind of going through. through. It. So with that, I hope you guys like the video. Hope to see you. Peace. We're starting off with the hands-on preview from IGN is the first video we're going to be looking after here. Let's get to it. I was waiting for you. Not for too long, I hope. I remember being awestruck as a teenager by the way Shadow of the Colossus dwarfed my protagonist with its titanic creatures. That feeling of man versus mountain generated by the PS2 classic is something I've rarely experienced since. But at a recent hands-on event for Final Fantasy XVI, it happened again. I felt that awe, that sense of colossal scale. But this time, rather than being a poetically beautiful battle, it was an explosive homage to anime warfare. All right, let's get some new gameplay, please. The two hour demo was, according to developer Square Enix, a special version made for media to experience and contents may differ from the final version. So my guess is media got different parts that they could talk about. Um, potentially we'll see here in a second. All from around five hours into the story, the combat focus segment contained a trio of boss battles that showcased Final Fantasy 16's ambitious approach to scale. The first of these, a showdown with a spy named Benedicta, was a traditional human versus human clash that embraced the dexterity of this entry's new real- We did see a little bit of this. Uh, stone attack. Same thing here that we've kind of seen before, our limit break gauge. We have Titan, Phoenix, and Garuda kind of equipped. How we get to acquire those. Pupper. Sorry, I'm blocking this here. So right below me here, same thing we've seen before. Um, actually, different spells for him. We can switch between the dog and the items by pressing left on the D-pad, it looks like. Um, and then our R2 attacks here. Jump, stone, titanic block. So. Uh, pretty straightforward from what we've seen so far. ...real-time action combat, but it was the other two, much grander fights that really caught my attention. Final Fantasy XVI sees a number of kingdoms caught up in a war over magical crystals. Key to this war are icons, colossal monsters that, if you're a Final Fantasy fan, you may know better as summons. In most previous games in the series, these deity-like creatures were effectively elaborate magic attacks. But in yep. Final Fantasy XVI, they are vital components of the plot and act as major boss battles across protagonist Clive's journey. One such icon is Garuda, a 20 meter tall bird-like creature summoned by Benedicta that wields the power of wind. Yep. As I dodged and weaved around Garuda's legs and wings, deflecting blows that would kill a normal man, the battle called to mind scenes from kaiju okay, movies and sick. anime like Attack on Titan. After dealing enough damage to stun her, I could fire a magic- The only thing is, it is kind of hard to see what Clive is doing. And as I dodged and weaved around Garuda's legs and wings, deflecting blows that would kill her- I hope this gets updated. Of course they did say as well already that this will be updated. They did say that this could be subject to change later on. I am hoping that this does get a little bit Annoying. polished. Granted, I understand we're in a tornado, but I can't- fucking see clive Man. like at all the like he's granted this is also through video but like if you had to point out where exactly he is you can't make him out Mind being right there kaiju movies and him wearing all dark armor just blends in um so hopefully that does get changed anime like attack on titan after dealing enough damage to stun her so there are those phoenix ability so let's watch this here really quick wings deflecting blows that would kill a normal man the battle called to mind scenes from kaiju movies and he anime dodges like on titan and then After phoenix shift 
and then we get this aerial burst precision I counter could fire shot. A magical grappling hook into her jaw and yank her head down to the ground, opening her face up for a chain of hugely damaging attacks. <laughs> There's yeah. something inherently exciting about fights this large, and Final Fantasy 16 seems to be fully committed to going as big as it possibly can. Also, notice that the health bar here, we have like a blank gauge. Maybe this regens over time. Kind of like, um, I want to say Street Fighter. One of the fighting games is like this. You take damage, and then if you don't take damage again, it, uh, it does slowly start to regen. Otherwise, this starts to go down as well. That's not to say the game's strengths are only in these gigantic boss fights, though. Much of the demo saw me storming through a castle while cutting down a... Okay, here we got fighting... Ma trash mobs, I guess we could call them. Whole garrison of swordsmen in the grittiest combat of Final Fantasy's 36 year history. Clive strikes with fury, impaling and even stomping on enemies that have fallen to the ground. That's not to say all the fantasy has been drawn out of Final Fantasy, though. Far from it. Magical abilities frequently coat the screen with vibrant particle effects. It's all a bit overwhelming at first, and the arcade-like UI that constantly spits out damage numbers is an ugly contrast against the world's otherwise handsome art. But as I settled into the systems, I found so the this blend is of new. action and tactical abilities rewarding. It particularly came along... Katan? Okay. That is a ninja spell that they can use in 14? Systems, I found the blend of... This is him using it. So he's using Gatan. Got it. He's breathing fire, right? ...and tactical abilities rewarding. It particularly came alive in the rapidly paced battle against Benedicta, who pushed me to make use of all of my many skills. Men of your talents are rare indeed. Clive is a nimble fighter, and each swing of his sword reminds you that... Here we have the giant ice slash crystal dragon again. Garuda grapple. Final Fantasy VI. It's going to be something pretty often used, I guess, versus these almost massive uh, icons. Dean's combat director is Ryoto Suzuki, best known for his work on Devil May Cry and Dragon's Dogma. Fights feel fast, layered, and incredibly flashy. The core yeah. fundamentals are pulled from it Japanese looks good. classics. Dodges, parries, uppercuts, and combo attacks. But built atop this is a magic system that sees you channel the power of different icons to unleash powerful special attacks. We have a multiplier here, so it's not too much damage. And how much damage does this do? Titan ability. System that sees you channel the power of different icons. We block. And then something's she staggered, and then we go into this like Titan abilities rage fist. Powerful special attacks. And we just fucking pummel her ass. Wind up. Damn. Oh shit. I had access to the power of three icons, the Fiery Phoenix, the Winds of Garuda, and the Earth-Shattering Magic of Titan. Only yeah. one icon's abilities can be channeled at a time, yeah. but a quick press of the left trigger cycles through each summon on the fly. You could fire a blast of Phoenix. And it looks like we have cooldowns here for these as well, so we can't just spam these abilities, uh, which is why we have the two symbols for the three. Uh, for Phoenix, Garuda, Titan. Flames, for instance, before quickly swapping to Garuda to launch your target into the air with a hurricane-like spin. And finally switch to Titan to finish them off with a charged power attack that strikes downwards with stone fists. Each what looks really good about this is, like, this combat looks like it's going to be hard, which means, ideally, that it will be rewarding if you can master it. You can probably, I'm sure there'll be somebody who'll be, like, uploading the YouTube montages of them, like, one-shotting bosses, zero damage taken, and some of the things you can do look so badass, so I'm kind of excited to see what we can do here with this. Icon ability has its own cooldown, so hot swapping between the mid-fight and managing their wait times provides a light tactical edge to each clash. I'm interested to discover what tactics will be unlocked as Clive gains the power of even more icons, and I hope they feel as distinct as the three I've used so far. Clive! If you're accustomed to Final Fantasy's more relaxed days of picking attacks from a menu and find all of this somewhat intimidating, you may find solace in Square's novel approach to accessibility. Rather than difficulty options, there's a collection of five rings that bestow combat easing effects. The Ring of Timely Evasion, for instance, will make Clive automatically dodge most incoming attacks, while the huh. Ring of Timely Strikes will perform elaborate combos with just one tap of the attack button. There are utility-focused rings too, including one that issues commands to Clive's dog, Torgal, who can provide attack and healing assistance. 
With the combat already sufficiently layered, I can imagine even skilled players may also opt to skip the pet micromanagement. These rings will hopefully mean fans of varying skill levels will all be able to enjoy Final Fantasy XVI's clashes, which are made all the more dramatic by the way your attacks can seamlessly blend into cinematics that showcase a particular. Dude, the cool abilities look so. Oh. These moments are coupled to a button prompt. And oh, it cut! I wanted to see that animation. Are coupled to a button prompt. Oh, <laughs> the D's. And while I'm generally averse to QTEs in combat, Square Enix seems to have made it work. The slick presentation made each of the boss battles feel like momentous fights, rather than interrupted melees. Cinematic the strike. overall sense is that Final Fantasy XVI will let us be directly involved in the outrageous anime-like battles typically reserved for cutscenes. That's never more true than in what is likely to become Final Fantasy XVI's flagship battle mode, Icon vs. Icon. When Clive summons an Icon, you're put in direct control of them. Okay, this is... This actually looks like some animation. Everything we've seen so far and all the other gameplay footage, I'm really curious to see more about this right now. And each of these explosive clashes between gods are promised to be a unique experience with bespoke mechanics. The third boss of the demo, a beatdown between Garuda and the fire demon Ifrit, was something akin to a nuclear-powered wrestling match. <laughs> Compared to Clive, Ifrit is a very simple fighter, with just a scant few brawling abilities. But this brawl makes full use of that blending between cutscene and gameplay to convey Ifrit's immense heft and strength. Each time I'd land a blow on Garuda, a new animation would trigger, my favourite of which was dragging my foe face first across a rocky landscape. <laughs> it was a shallower combat experience compared to controlling Clive in the clashes with Benedicta and Garuda, but I can forgive that if the spectacle proves this wild each yeah. and every time. Playing three very different boss fights, as well as carving my way through dozens of regular soldiers, has left me with a lot of hope for Final Fantasy XVI. But this demo was purely combat focused, meaning I've yet to see much of its RPG credentials. This demo's generic medieval castle setting barely had any exploration opportunities, feeling mostly like a stone wall. So we know we're gonna fight Benedict on top of some sort of like mountain, some mountain, some type, sort of the top of a castle. My goodness, can't route talk. Towards the next boss. But as previously mentioned, the contents of this demo may differ from the final version, and so I hope when more is revealed, we'll discover it has environments that are much more compelling Sid. to explore. Because should the story, exploration, and characters live up to what I've seen of the combat so far, then Final Fantasy XVI will be a JRPG worth being excited about. Yeah. Control it, Kai. For more looks at upcoming games... Okay, that was an interesting context right there, because we've never seen that. You have Sid telling Clive to control it, which means he might not go, uh, be able to control Ifrit completely. For more looks at upcoming games, check out our previews of Crime Boss Rock A City and Kerbal Space Program 2. And for Sweet. everything else, stick with IGN. Alright, here we go. Video number two, FF16 preview. This is from GameSpot. GameSpot, sweet. So we're gonna get straight into it. Let's get into this bad boy. Final Fantasy has been gradually shedding parts of its turn-based RPG roots and embracing a more action-oriented direction. It was only a matter of time before that focus on action took precedence over the role-playing. We're getting some big-ass numbers, by the way, for these uh, the icon battles. Elements, and it appears that Final Fantasy 16 is finally the moment the ratio has flipped. As a longtime fan of the traditional Final Fantasy games, I wasn't quite sure what to think of this development. The turn-based classics are still some of my favorite gaming experiences of all time, but after an extensive hands-on with the game, I've come around on this direction for the series. Or at least this entry in it. If Final Fantasy is an action franchise now, at least it's shaping up to be a damn so, so far, this gameplay footage, I do want to say this too, looks a little bit more clear. It just could have been how it was captured or recorded between the IGN one and this one. This one's a little bit more crisp and it's kind of easier to tell what's going on. We'll see if we go back to that Garuda Clive scene where if it's still really hard to make out what the hell's going on because of how dark it is. Damn good one. This isn't to say the game lacks fantastical elements like mythical beasts. And so here we get this this scene that we've gotten right with this line awaken child of fate and they're not telling us who is saying it which is whoever says this line to us is pretty unique character because they're specifically hiding it in the gameplay that they're now giving to us 
than magic spells, but those are used to complement the story and action rather than as a layer of menu abstraction. In the fictional high fantasy world of Valistia, an extremely small number of mortals are innately gifted as dominants. So this looks like the first scene here where I'm assuming Clive awakens as Ifrit. Awaken child of, of fate. Menu abstraction. Awaken In fictional... Ifrit. And we know Clive is Ifrit, as we just saw from the IGN one. Um, it looks like Clive does have some sort of difficulty controlling Ifrit, at least earlier on. I'm assuming at some point he'll start to learn and take control and learn how to master that ability at least. High fantasy world of Valistia, an extremely small number of mortals are innately gifted as dominants. And then here we get a scene of Clive starting his transformation. I start to glow. Host for supernatural I Where the hell is this? So apparently when we do fight Garuda, it's on like 5,000 feet in the air. Here, it's amongst the clouds. Uh, assuming this is might be Garuda's tornado. Which long time Final Fantasy fans will recognize as summoned creatures. Oh shit. Icons are essentially weapons of mass destruction and the various nation states use their icons as symbols of their power and culture. Yeah. The dominants are respected, feared. And here it looks like we get a cinematic cutscene for Clive as he's transitioning into Ifrit, assumably, assumedly, and sometimes even exploited by their respective nations as the implied threat of the icons keeps other nations in check. The protagonist Clive's brother, Joshua, was given a place of honor as the dominant of Phoenix, Phoenix, the aspect of fire. Clive's journey is one of revenge as an attack from an invading army and a mysterious previously unseen icon left his younger brother dead. My play session took place when Clive was in his 20s, obsessed with vengeance and throwing his lot in with revolutionaries who are looking to overthrow the social order. This segment of the story tightly focused on just three major characters, which helped illustrate how the political and magical machinations play out amid the interpersonal. So here you have this figure again. Assumedly, this is also the same person that says Awaken, Child of Fate, Awaken Ifrit, who we don't know unless there's like the equivalent of FF16 or Valestia's uh, Astians, where they're a group of rogue men who are of some super evil plot of something they're trying to do for whatever reason. Own relationships. Clive was accompanied by Sidolphus Talaman, this game's Sid, another Sid. Final Fantasy mainstay, and who is Ramu. both a freedom fighter for magical refugees and the dominant of Rama, the aspect of light. Rama. Their mission brought them to a castle. I'm going to call him Ramu because that's what I'm used to. I know it's wrong, but still give me a break. Started by Benedicta Harmon, the dormant of Garuda, Uba. aspect of wind, and apparently Sid's old flame. Clive was also accompanied by his loyal and very good boy dog, Torgal, who acts as a consistent companion boy, character in battle. If Torgal dies, we write. So these uh, charadas again. Really quick, something I do want to check out here. If it seems like I'm focusing heavily on the story, it's because I find that aspect interesting right from the start. The best Final Fantasy stories use fantastical elements to say something about the human condition, and nation states having entered an uneasy cold war as each of them harbor their own personal living, breathing WMDs is a fa- So who the fuck is this guy? He's- Re pops up, and it looks like Garuda tries to fucking kill him. So- even for whatever reason, we might have some sort of quarrel where uh, Benedicta and Clive Sid kind of have some different viewpoints on how things should be going about between the nations and icons, what's right, what's wrong. Um, it might be we all have a common disinterest in whoever the f this guy is because he might be the one f screwing things up. Sorry, can't cuss anymore. It's YouTube policy. Anyways, it looks like Rude attacks. Let's watch this again and nation states having entered an uneasy cold war as each of them harbor their own personal living, breathing WMDs is a fascinating hook that feels relatable to real life conflicts. Or does she grab him? <sighs> it's so hard. This tornado scene is really hard nation to make states out. Having entered an uneasy 
story. It's so he is on the cliff. She either attacks him or grabs him with her talon. Because I find that aspect interesting right from the start. The best Final Fantasy stories use fantastical elements to say something about the human condition. And nation states having entered an uneasy cold war as each of them harbor their own personal living, breathing WMD. That looks like it's not a friendly grab. So I'm going to assume Gruta saw him is just like, I'm taking this asshole out. Maybe that's my, that's what it looks like. This is a fascinating hook that feels relatable to real life conflicts. The fact that some nations worship their dominance and others imprison them as living weapons speaks to the breadth of how we treat things we don't understand. On top of that, these super powered beings have their own human lives and relationships. Oh which... shit, what a way to enter a fight. <laughs> Let's watch this again. Others imprison them as living weapons speaks to the breadth of how we treat things we don't understand. On top of that. So not even going for Clive, but takes out the ground underneath that, us. These super which sends him into a free fall. Powered beings have their own human lives. And, and then the HUD pops up for a transition into a fight with Garuda. That's so cool, dude. Which adds yet another wrinkle to every interaction. It's the interplay of all these disparate elements that stands out the most and made me care about the characters as I explored. An engaging story wouldn't amount to much without a strong battle system to back it up. And on that front, I was more skeptical. In Final Fantasy 16, you control one character, Clive right. Rosefield, and the entire story revolves around his perspective as he matures over the course of decades. The singular focus on Clive as the sole protagonist, sometimes but not always flanked by AI-controlled companion characters, seem to indicate a de-emphasis on- We just pulled a scorpion come over here. Yo, that is so sick. AI-controlled companion- Let's slow this down just a second, because that actually is so cool. Companion characters seem to indicate a- Deadly embrace. The emphasis. Ooh. Yep, there pops up there. On juggling. Point, point. That's actually so sick. Mans from party members with disparate skill sets, which is part of the joy of a traditional Final Fantasy game. Final Fantasy 16 replaces this level of strategic intensity with a battle system that feels naturally action based, but with the underpinnings of. So we just loot shit by getting close to it. That is convenient. With disparate skill sets, which is part of the joy. Did Sid just almost like did so much damage that one hit looks like. Way of a traditional Final Fantasy game. We get experience and whatever this is here. Ah, they kept the same symbol for experience from Final Fantasy 14. It's very Yoshi P. Final what this symbol is though, I do not know. Some sort of currency or ability points probably actually you know what this probably is the re uh, currency that we use for our abilities that will save up um in the other video we broke down there was a screenshot where you could kind of see the talent trees regarding the icons abilities that we could use i'm assuming these points are going to be used for that most likely final fantasy 16 replaces this level of strategic intensity with a battle system that feels naturally so there we get gil but with the and then we get another item, a bloody hide. These looks like different items that we can use either for some sort of crafting, um, some sort of synthesis, forging of some sort, I would imagine, upgrading something along those lines for our gear, weapons, or items. Um, there's got to be some sort of purpose for the raw materials, something, especially something like a bloody hide. Could be a resource for maybe an up armor upgrade or for crafting a new piece of armor underpinnings of choice as clive proceeds through the story he picks up abilities from the different icons so that is where we're gonna fight benedicta uh same starry night top up here looks like this is exactly where that's gonna go down as clive proceeds this transition through the door is so clean um no loading of any sort the story he picks up abilities from the different icons he encounters this doesn't make him their dominant but it does mean that his fighting style this looks like the guy who used katan in the last video we just saw now will be imbued with magical flourishes that embody their unique trait. oh he is in fact a ninja this is uh him dominant but it does so it's hard to see these 
the dark scenes is really hard to tell make stuff out um sorry if that doesn't come through too clearly but um he is in fact wielding two daggers here in a second it should be a little bit easier to see his fighting style will be imbued with magical flourishes that embody their unique traits there for the demo he had blessings of phoenix fire garuda wind Baton. and titan earth so these look like they're unblockable attacks which is why we get this alert saying you need to dodge because you cannot block a fire breath ability fire. garuda wind and titan earth you can swap between these on the fly and use their unique spell abilities to complement your array of melee attacks. Phoenix, for example. Well, what was that? Hello? Some sort of like counter? Complement your array of melee attacks. Titanic block. Attack. Precision block. Takedown. Okay, and now he is staggered. Phoenix, for example, is particularly agile and able to close gaps while Garuda is better for air juggles and reaching out with its harpy-like claws to grab enemies from afar. Titan feels very... So it looked like it cut back again to... So yeah, to the ninja. Tognavolder, I, I probably screwed that up, so don't... I'm curious to see how our limit break works, though. Titan feels very different from both of these. With heavy attacks that often you can block at least with titan's ability so maybe this is different maybe this is just something specific to titan uh kind of like he's talking about right now right it sounds like each icon has different types of combat that they specialize in so it's going to be really knowing which when to use which icon based off the situation that we're in based off the combat scenario and require a brief charge to deliver their full impact the combat system not only allows but demands <laughs> that's what it looks like it's so cool raging fist 20 and 30 sweep between these abilities since each of them has its own cooldown that will be in various states of recharging while you swap to another but the cooldowns were generous oh, shit. you're clearly intended to use the full suite of moves quickly oh, and shit. to swap between them constantly at first, I found swapping between these disoriented. Yo, that was actually such sick timing on the dodge. So this is telegraphed, right? Intended to use the full suite of moves quickly. So tornado, we run. And to swap between them constantly. Nose dive. She flies up. It's telegraphed exactly where she's gonna come down. First, at. I found swapping. And then he dodges like literally the last second. Unless he has the the ring or whatever the thing was called, where it gives us, uh abilities that we it'll execute automatically such as like dodging or counters something like that i believe is what was said thing between these disorienting especially when i would tap a titan ability having forgotten it requires a charged button hold instead but after only a couple of hours it felt much more natural and i could see room for a great deal of flexibility in the system Hold on a second, let's go back here. For a great deal of flexibility in the system. So he used sick. This uh opens up here as well. This goes up. Uh this is the limit break ability as well. The limit break is slowly going down, and we're just pummeling her ass when she's staggered because she takes increased damage. Bowers. Okay, let's Let's go back. Really when again. I would tap a Titan ability, having forgotten. And boom, staggered. And it requires a charge. So she's taking increased damage by 0 0.05, it looks like. Or probably more, but it's this part is less than otherwise we'd melt her with uh, the icon abilities. Button hold instead. But after only a couple of hours, it felt much more natural. And I could see. And then here is our limit break. And it says right there. Room for a great deal of flexibility boom, in the system. Boom, boom, boom. 1.4. So now we're really fucking her up. Uh, she's about to die. My god. Boom. Ability finish. Semi-prime finish. Each of the icon abilities, along with Clive's standard melee attacks... Ah, uh, so you can change out the abilities too? Bro, Okay, confirmed. That is our ability points. Oh, I love this. Oh my god, dude. This looks so good. This game looks so good. Alright, we get the HUD. This is the menu. Items, attributes. So this is going to be our skills, abilities. Gear and icons. I'm sorry. 
Attributes is different from abilities. Uh, attributes looks like it's just our stats, our equipment, a ring. So the ring says this is what they were talking about before in the last video. Our long sword. So different armor. Our stagger, I'm assuming, decreases the effect that which will stagger and maybe even the amount of damage you do when they are staggered. Strength, vitality, will. Um, I'm assuming we just have a strength stat, no magic stat. Uh, all of our damage is just built up through our attack, it would appear. What is our will? I'm assuming this is linked to strength. This is defense is linked to vitality. Will is probably linked to stagger. That's going to be my guess. I love the fucking old school. Um, uh, the 2D models for this. This is, I, it's just so, so Final Fantasy. It's just like Chef's Kiss little detail. It's just, it's just too good. Uh, this is also in the Green Tower at Cairn Norvent. Uh, wow. Okay. Has its Keep own going. upgrade trait. I explored the tree and upgraded a few moves, unlocking new combat abilities and enhancing the strength. All right, this is gear and icons, so we can change out the icons. Probably not going to show us more than this, even though we know some of the other icons already. Uh, we have our gear, same thing that we saw. Our sword, our brace, uh, belt, and our bracer looks like the only gear that we will have. Let's go back just to double check that. Belt bracer, yep, three rings. Jump back forward again. Our necklace, two rings. Um, I assume. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. It looks like our neck, two rings. And it looks like the ability is here. So Phoenix Shift, and then once we Phoenix Shift, it looks like we can use our Q and our triangle abilities. If that's the correct term, technically. Recommend abilities hold, optimize gear, hold a remove icon, change icon order, so we can customize all of that as well. Wow, this looks so good. The strength of some of my favorite moves. Choosing which icon. Really quick, I'm going to go back. Let's just listen to what he says for this part as well. Each of the icon abilities, along with Clive's standard melee attacks, has its own upgrade trait. I explored the tree and upgraded a few moves, unlocking new combat abilities and enhancing the strength of some of my favorite moves. Choosing which icons to equip and how to upgrade them looks as if it will provide ample strategic decision making in the moments between. Okay, yep, so confirmed ability points is in fact for this. So we have our gold, our gill, as well as our ability points, which we will use to upgrade uh, different weapons, precision dodge. Okay. So master it, I don't know if it looks like we will be able to rank them up to different levels. It might just be one level just to upgrade it, and then it's mastered. That might be it. <laughs> Executing a dodge with R1 at the moment of an enemy attack not only increases evasion efficacy, but also allows for counterattacks using either square or triangle, which looks like is what he used for Garuda's drop-down ability, where he dodged literally at the last second, um, and then instantly countered with that move. Between battles. If anything, I was spoiled for choice, as the upgrade options looked like equally exciting and fun ways to mix up my arsenal of moves. These choices then pay off with white knuckle to combat when you're in the thick of a fight. God, this just makes me think about like a super boss possibility in 16, which we should get. 15 kind of had that. Um, I don't know if you want to include the Adamantois was just a meat shield of HP, um, or if you want to include Omega Weapon or Garuda, but, uh, this, this, the possibilities, and I'm just thinking of what we could do, and it's just like, ooh, it just sounds so good, I'm salivating just thinking about it. Square Enix boasts that it brought on Devil May Cry veteran Ryota Suzuki as its battle designer, yep. and the moment-to-moment -moment melee combat mixed with magical ranged abilities. Bruh, Devil May Cry 4? Marvel vs. Capcom 2. This guy is literally all about... This guy understands combat and gaming. 
Dragon's Dogma and Devil May Cry 5. Certainly felt reminiscent of Dante and Nero. The game that most came to mind when I played though was another action franchise, God of War. That's because the melee battles are punctuated by icon battles, uniquely built action set pieces that feel markedly different than the standard battles. Seeing this now and after hearing him say that, it exactly looks like I'm getting flashbacks to Ragnarok. Um, especially this the quick time event during the combat, which I don't have a problem with. This looks badass. And are particularly exciting. While traversing the castle, I came face to face with Benedicta, an enjoyably scenery chewing antagonist with dramatic flair. Benedicta first called on the aspect of Garuda to a limited degree, turning into a superpowered demi human version of herself with wings. Sid met her in kind, half transforming into Rama, resulting in a clash of superpowered beings that still looked roughly like their human characters and still acting with their own human motivations. The ensuing battle involved fighting two other harpy-like creatures that she summoned. Yo, I want to see that just for a second. Fighting two other harpy- Bro, it's not in detail. It's more focused here and this is kind of like blurried on purpose. But you can even hear them breathing here for a second. Listen to this. With their own human motivations. The ensuing battle involved fighting two other harpy- Yo, it sounds creepy. And they even look kind of pointy and jaggedy and creepy themselves. Like creatures that she summoned and later... Yeah, so we fight these two, a pink one and a green one. ...referred to as her sisters, ah. and then progress to fighting her in half... Wait a second. Are these the two that are in FF14 as well? Chirata and Suparna, yeah. Oh my god, okay, that makes perfect sense. I... That makes perfect sense, actually. Okay. I get that. Okay, sweet. Nice little detail. I never realized that that was their actual names. They are just ads in a fight. Two other harpy-like creatures that she summoned, and later referred to as her sisters, and then progressed to fighting her in half-icon form on a tower rooftop. It was a test of skill for all I had learned up to that point while also tossing in cinematic story elements. Step on me. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. It's just like... <laughs> they just made it so so easy. They just put it right there. It's just like, yeah, step on me. Benedicta. One moment, when Toro leaped to my defense, clenched his jaw around Benedicta's oh, neck. Oh, shit. Was a real fist pumping moment for me, which isn't a feeling I often associate with this franchise. Her injuring Let's and then tossing horrible. my canine pal aside while spitting a curse made me that much more determined to destroy her. Of course, this all led to the real set piece moment an icon on icon battle between Ifrit and Garuda. Like all icon battles, this was crafted to be its own distinct encounter pitting Ifrit's ability and brute strength against Garuda's ability to control the battlefield with the wind. And it- So it looks like we need to use our actions based off of- This is actually- That whole Marvel vs. Capcom part kind of looks to fruition here. There's four buttons you can do, and you have to kind of react and choose the right action based off what she's doing, right? This actually looks- Granted, this looks very simplistic in mind, just four buttons, right? But this looks so cool, especially on the the theatric level of this fight of two practically kaijus fighting each other. It was an absolute blast. A kaiju battle come to life with all the dramatic underpinnings of the human story that had informed it. The uniqueness of the encounter meant that I was largely learning its mechanics on the fly, but this didn't feel like it was meant to be challenging like the traditional oh, melee combat. Instead, it was made to be a spectacle and something to reward all of the effort leading up to that point. This looks so cool. <laughs> Dodge. Evade. Oh, is it okay? Sidestep. To the extent that this new, more action-heavy focus might put on long time the evade. The series, Lunge? Square Enix has come up with a pretty ingenious variable difficulty system. <laughs> 
Final Fantasy 16 has a story mode, but unlike many <laughs> games, this looks so cool, build. I just can't. Oh my gosh, this game's gonna be incredible. There's no way it's not. It's no way it's not good, man. There's just no way. That use that name for an easier difficulty level. It instead simply turns on a couple of helpful assists. These assists are available whether you choose story mode or not. So turning them on simply makes them the default. But it's exactly how these assists are implemented that makes the system so smart. When you include complex ability combinations, can be executed as simply pressing square. So I'm assuming there will be challenge runs where there's like no rings, things like that. People would min max to see which one's the best and for certain reasons and all that stuff, of course. But these looks convenient. That way it's not like information control and button overload for somebody, especially who's might not be used to an action RPG. Instead of menu options, the assists are presented as a series of five special rings that grant different types of assistance. One of them simplifies combat so that simply pressing one button automatically controls your combos, for example, while another extends the window for a successful dodge. You can equip these rings in your three accessory slots, but that means you'll always have more rings than you have space to put them in. You'll have to choose which, if any, to use to make combat easier on you. This also presents an opportunity cost as each slot taken up by one of the assist rings is one fewer accessory you can use to customize Clive's other abilities. Ah, interesting. So you are rewarded as well for not learning these abilities and getting used to them rather than being reliant on the rings. I actually kind of like that. For casual players, people might be like, oh, no, I don't like that. I actually think that's cool. It gives you a reason to want to learn how to get better at using different abilities and um, mechanics in the game so you're not as reliant on the rings. You can actually use different accessories to make Clive even stronger. The whole system seems thoughtful and elegant, letting you still feel the thrill of combat while gently nudging you towards removing the training wheels as you get more comfortable. This new focus on action combat does come at a price though. Square Enix has already stated that Final Fantasy 16 doesn't use an open world structure, which may remove some of the expansive scope and awe of the traditional Final Fantasy game. My play session consisted of a fairly straightforward level design with only brief side paths to discover some treasures Item? and then proceed along the main path. The producers noted that the full game has wider spaces, which should provide a sense of exploration, but I didn't experience them for myself. A narrower level structure may just be the nature of this genre shift as Final Fantasy. I like how easy to see where enemies are on the HUD and the square filled up just determines how close they are. That's actually really nice. I like that. Simple, easy to see and read. 16 crosses the threshold into full fledged action spectacle. Some aspects are bound to feel different than RPG fans have grown accustomed to. For this RPG fan, though, the change of pace is welcome. Who knows what the future holds for Final Fantasy, but I'm convinced that this is the right direction for this entry in the franchise. I went in as a doubter and came out as a true believer, eager to experience the ride. Damn. Oh my God, that's only the second video. So I don't know what more details we can get, but I do, we did get some different stuff there, which I really did like. But man, this game looks so good. I loved seeing the actual menuing here, because that was the first time we've really seen that. Uh, but damn, does it look good. Wow. All right, GameSpot video done. Let's see what else we can get here. All right, next up is Eurogamer's video of the gameplay preview for combat and new gameplay. Let's do it. Excited for Final Fantasy 16 is a bit of an understatement. We didn't fully warm to 13 or 15. Diva me timbers. Never really had the time to get into 14. And as much as we loved recent nice remakes fun. and remasters, we are yearning for something new from the final. So there's that ring in effect right there. Um, that's actually really cool to see. But it's just from media preview build of FF16. Okay, it's their graphic. As much as we loved recent. So this is a in long period uh a aurora nice okay so different levels of spells 
Whether we'll be able to use spells, we can fire a right there. I guess that'll be linked to the different icons we have equipped. We'll determine which spells we can use. And remasters, we are yearning for. But here we see the different spells. So we have the prolonged time to actually dodge, kind of slows down. From the Final Fantasy franchise. After pouring over all of the release def and this might look different in the final game. All these guys are giving the disclaimer that they have to do this. They probably signed something saying that they have to do this. Uh, because, of course, this is probably still in alpha. And their game is still subject to changes. Which is pretty standard stuff. Uh, here we see one of the castles here in the background with one of the mother crystals as well. Super badass uh, background scenery here. F16 trailers, we published an in-depth explainer about everything we knew about Final Fantasy 16 so far. Some fire spam there, and holy shit, what was that? Everything we knew about Final Fantasy 16 so far. <laughs> so it just says goodbye. Last year, check that out now if you want a basic spoiler-free primer on the world and the story. But now, finally, our colleagues are actually getting to play it. Eurogamer's Ed Nightingale recently went hands-on with a preview of the game, and thankfully has some very positive things to say about it. So here are Ed's thoughts with some gorgeous new gameplay to go along. So this gameplay is the most crisp so far. It's in 1440, so that makes sense. Got it. Okay, this is higher quality. I was going to say, it's actually very clear. You can see the definition, the details in the leaves, everything. Uh, animations look more crisp and it's like okay that's because it's a higher quality video along with them a heads up this game holy shit takes place a couple of hours into the game but it mainly focuses so it looks like gruda is not in fact attacking him okay glad we finally get to see that uh as for we're after him and then gruda's kind of stalling us it, i guess is a word we can use for that on the real-time combat system so major story spoilers apart from one big battle will be at a minimum that said, it is a big battle that is featured, so maybe skip if you're planning on going into the game totally fresh. Ooh. I love the fact that these different cinematic fights Almost feels like it looks like you're playing a movie. So then, according to Ed, playing Final Fantasy 16 is a total rush. What struck most of all during the playthrough was the sheer scale and intensity of the game's battles, which gave a real sense of escalation across the demo. When it starts, you're going up against unnamed and not too challenging armored soldiers, which eventually led to a mini boss against twin elemental enemies, all before a climactic and lengthy boss. Oh, you can get hit during animations. So watch this. Against twin elemental enemies. This guy's gonna hit Clive. He's gonna take damage. All before a yeah, his health bar goes down. That kind of sucks. I'm not gonna lie. The boss encounter atop a castle at night as sparks fly and the dramatic choral score ratchets up the tension. Damn, that did a shit ton of damage and stagger. Holy! Fly and the dramatic choral score Boom. ratchets up Boom. the tension. I did almost half of her stagger bar in like an eighth of her health closer, like I guess the tenth. The excitement. There was also a separate icon battle in the demo that followed that literally took the game to colossal new heights. Naoki Yoshida, aka Yoshi P, one of the creatives behind the success of Final Fantasy XIV and a producer for Final Fantasy XVI, has dead. described this game as like a roller coaster. And so far, it really seems like he wasn't lying. According to Ed, this Final Fantasy XVI demo was a relentless, extended crescendo of thrills. A lot of these thrills are down to the fast and in. Hold on, I want to see that scene again. Go back. Isn't lying. According to Ed, this Final Fantasy 16 demo was a relentless, extended crescendo of okay. thrills. A lot of these thrills are. She tries to blast to him and hits his arm. Then he grabs system. her arm. Devil May Cry 5's Ryota Suzuki has designed this to be completely real time, without menus or turns. The Final Fantasy That's so cool, dude. The talents coming down is actually so the sick. Remake was something of a hybrid system in the. <laughs> it's actually these animations now seeing it in 1440 is so crisp devil may cry 5's ryota suzuki has designed this to be completely real time without many 
these scenes are also so much easier to see compared to before as well in the higher quality. So this is actually really nice video to watch so far. News or turns. The Final Fantasy VII Remake was something of a hybrid system in this regard so as to evoke the original game while updating things for modern gameplay sensibilities. But here, Final Fantasy XVI is fully embracing the new as an action RPG. The fluidity of combat and its array of interlinking options. So some of this video, unless you're a gamer and Game Informer, are the same. Some of this is literally is the exact same gameplay. Clive's basic move set includes sword attacks and magic to shoot from a distance, and these both can also be charged for added strength. Last-minute dodges can be followed by a precision counter, meaning players who successfully read enemy attack patterns and dodge correctly will be rewarded. It looks super satisfying to pull off. So through combat here, let's see the gauge going up. Correctly will be rewarded. Doing damage, it boom. Get the notification. L three R R R three. Initiate. Super satisfying to pull off. On top of that, there's the new addition of icon abilities that can be cycled through like weapon sets. These not only provide an elemental edge to your attacks, they also have unique abilities too. Phoenix, for instance, provides a lurching rush at the enemy, while Garuda has a grappling arm and Titan a stone shield for those keen to tank. These moves can then be linked together. Charge up a fire spell, then rush into an enemy for a sword lunge, dodge and counter an incoming attack, then target another with a grappling arm and spinning whirlwind of claws to toss an enemy into the air ready to juggle. Cycling through icon sets seemed a little fiddly in the heat of the moment, but this could also be because the demo showcased abilities that won't actually be available at this early point in the game. So presumably switching between icons will have a much gentler learning curve in the final game. Although we didn't get to try them out, the menus showed a glimpse of FF16's customization options. Each icon has a separate wheel of abilities that can be individually unlocked. That ability looks fucking broken. Granted, it's a ring slot use, but... ...using ability points, and then mapped to specific buttons. Points can also be reversed and spent elsewhere if you're keen to experiment. Clive can be kitted out with various weapons, armors, and accessories. The latter of which, interestingly, ties into the game's accessibility options. So this was the scene before that I complained about, and I think it was the worst scene, but seeing it here now, in 1440, I can clearly tell where Clive is. Can also see that resources I can see everything going around here, where Garuda, her outline is, and it's not just like, Clive's not this dark Selected color. Selected after battle can be used in crafting, although this system wasn't shown. Clive is joined in battle by party members who will be controlled by AI. So although you won't have direct control, Yoshida promises plenty of chatter and communication. To be honest, Clive's moveset is complex and engaging enough without the addition of other characters anyway. But there is one exception in permanent companion Torgal the dog. He's controlled with the D-pad, as is Itemius, and he can either heal Clive or add to his combos. It's a little bit finicky Stone. to use smoothly and effectively, but if you didn't want to micromanage him, Torgal's moves can instead be automated using the game's accessibility options. And yes, you can pet him. Bad luck. <laughs> Good boy. This looks so cool, man. <laughs> I already seen it, but it's cool every time. <laughs> it's so crisp. The animations, everything is so good looking. Oh, shit. <laughs> Yo. Yo, Torgal. Watch this. Oh shit! Yo, that would actually just kill you. That's actually just like... <laughs> oh my god. He literally bites her, spins around her, uses momentum, and then yeets her. <laughs> so, combat is tense, demanding, and... Oh my god, dude. This game's gonna be... It's it can't be bad. It's impossible for this game to be bad. It's impossible.
This game is going to be incredible. Very fun, requiring precision to dodge and attack before unleashing a fierce barrage of spells and abilities. But now let's talk about icon battles, because they are simply on another level. Each of the icon battles in the game will offer a unique set piece focusing on gameplay specific to that battle, be it a 3D shooter or a clash center. Ah, so there's different things you can do. So this one, I think, was that the fireball? And it countered it. Focusing on gameplay specific to that battle, be it a 3D shooter. Yeah, or a so clash press center fireball and, and it and countered speed. out her the icon battle arrow. Ed experienced between Ifrit and Garuda was described by Yoshida as like a wrestling match. It definitely showed the titanic heft and scale of these huge summonable creatures and served as a great climax to the demo. The battle began with Clive fighting the massive wind element icon Garuda, a terrifying clawed creature who towers over Clive with her gigantic feathered wings, their battle taking place in the midst of a swirling maelstrom. As a test of battle skill, it brought to mind the trials of Final Fantasy XIV, but played solo, a singular platform for a so we're spamming R2 here, the stone this ability. Counter. Now this was epic enough, but then it escalated once more in a duel between Garuda and the hulking fiery behemoth, Ifrit. This was pure Final Fantasy Kaiju fan service, witnessing these iconic beasts battle at a scale unprecedented in the series. Ifrit stomps and lurches forwards and unleashes flaming attacks, while Garuda spins and swirls in the sky, all controlled by the player, at least for the most part. As the battle swoops into cinematics, it does dissolve into an interactive cutscene with button prompts, but then the screen erupts into a burst of the almighty ultimate move Hellfire as the music soars. And Final Fantasy summons have never felt so powerful. Oh shit. <laughs> Yo. This claw straight in the chest. And Final Fantasy summons have never Oh, right in the actual right in the stomach. Felt Look so at the powerful blood or integral to the world and the story. I mean, I think the last time summons took center stage narratively like this was maybe Final Fantasy X. But anyway, here it is all just so seamless. Ex oh shit, she just blows off a chunk of his hip. But anyway, here it is all just Boom. So and look seamless. at this, all this. Exploration, oh, he's regenning. And cinematics flow effortlessly from one to the next. Oh, that's what happens before, and then one his arm. Caught in battle, and then the camera his neck. lunges inwards for yet another scene with exceptional cinematography before control is handed back. Sometimes the lines are blurred with quick time events during battle cinematics, but these are simple and unobtrusive. Oh serving <laughs> Yo, rotisserie chicken, anybody? Holy sh! To punctuate the action. Unsurprisingly, it is delivered beautifully too. Okay, we haven't seen this before. Final Fantasy 16 is stunning, both on a technical and artistic level. Characters are memorable and animated with nuance and subtlety. During so it looks like does he turn into Ramu because Clive goes insane here as Ifrit? So this is Rama. That's not Sid. That's actual Rama. And unsurprisingly, it is delivered beautifully too. Final Fantasy 16 is stunning, both on a technical and artistic level. Characters are memorable and animated with- It looks like he can't control himself almost. Like he's just aimlessly looking around like what's going on. And I wonder if he does that because Clive goes like frenzied and he's trying to get him to chill out, come back nuance and subtlety. During cinematics, you can see the tiny wrinkles and expressions on their faces. So far, we are really loving the cast and their performances. As Clive, Ben Starr is clipped and brooding, and Ralph Ineson, Sidolphus, is deep and rumbling. Cold and dark castle corridors are warmly lit by flaming torches. A storm rages outside, ripping apart the ground. And when the battle strikes, the effects are completely electrifying. <laughs> Here. Somewhat unfortunate. Okay, there's another video of this inside Clive, the castle. Most of Final Fantasy 16's world shown in the demo was a soulsy and rather dark medieval castle. Though tiny glimpses elsewhere showed wide plains and crystalline caverns, volcanoes, deserts. That's a badass looking sword, by the way. Taverns and more, all richly detailed with vibrant, striking vistas. So we're very excited to see more. 
Yoshida has confirmed that the game is not open world. It's made up of different self-contained areas constructed in extreme detail, each large and offering plenty of exploration. Hopefully, this design choice will help strike a balance between Final Fantasy XVI's world building and its storytelling. On story, actually, Yoshida has promised it will be complete, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Of all the criticisms thrown at Final Fantasy XIII and XV over the years, story has been a major complaint. So the True. team behind XVI are keen to learn from the past and deliver a grand, yet cohesive and comprehensible story and likeable characters, on top of a beautifully realized world to explore. Eurogamer's Ed reports then that what he's played of Final Fantasy XVI so far seems set to deliver. Its intense battles escalate to an outrageous sense So what the hell happens to her face? Because her face regions, something happens to her. Kind of like what we saw just happen in Ifrit, where he regions. Assuming that Garuda probably is dead and then nope, no she's not. Oh, her wings regening? Ed reports then that her, she has talents at the tips the of her wings. The of Final Fantasy XVI so far seems set to deliver. Its intense battles escalate to an outrageous sense of scale. Exceptional cinematics weave seamlessly into battle to truly showcase the power of the PlayStation 5. The sisters again. And Yoshida and his team exude confidence in their vision. That all sounds very exciting to us. So now we're keen to get a look at the rest ah, of Ah, so they add this as an intro for them. Um, uh, during the Beautiful demo. world and spend some real time with these characters. Hopefully, we won't have to wait too long to get a hands-on ourselves. Thanks again to Ed Nightingale for his thoughts on the demo. Do I wonder if we get to play this demo the later as well on. As a separate piece on Final Fantasy 16's accessibility. We'll put a link to it in the description below. So, what do you think of the gameplay scene so far? Let us know in the comments as well as which icon battles you're looking forward to playing. We are going to have loads more on Final Fantasy 16 on the channel very soon. So make sure you're subscribed oh, shit. to stay up to date. There Thanks he is. Thanks for watching. Bye. Yeah, this is the first full shot we get of him. Zap. Yep. Yeah, so that's right. He looks like he's trying to get him to chill the F out. Yo, look at the staff. Wait, no, what is this? I can't tell. Hold on. No, we want uh, annotations. Will that change it? Is that just part of his armor? It's just part of his armor. Damn, that's badass. <laughs> Shit. Yo. Yo. Oh my god, dude. This game looks incredible. Alright. Man, each one just gives us something new. Oh my gosh, I can't stop geeking out over this game, man. It just looks too good. Alright, next video we got here is FF16, uh, game, uh, sorry, video, uh, by Skill Up, but more specifically, uh, we are gonna be going over the review, or sorry, review. We are gonna be going over the interview that he did with Yoshi P, considering uh, the fact that at this point, we do know that everything is all the exact same to our Sakeem play. They all got the experience. Uh, he goes over everything, so I'm gonna go specifically to the part where he starts interviewing Yoshi P here. So let's do it. So that was my hands-on time with the game. And as I said, I loved it. I think it looks spectacular, both in its technical detail and its art design. I think the music is superb, but I wouldn't expect any less from Soken. I think the dialogue and voice work is excellent. I think the combat Look how good the scheme looks, man. It's like, look how Gruda interacts to the grapple stuck to her face. I loved it. I think it looks spectacular, both in its technical detail and its art design. I think the music is superb, but I wouldn't expect any less from Soken. I think the dialogue and voice work. Like, look at this, the way it's just the particles 
look is excellent. I think the combat. Look, like she's trying to pull her face away. It just looks so good. It's accessible, yet clearly has a lot of flexibility and depth. And I think the boss. She tries to fight and then yanks her back down to the ground, and then you start whacking the shit out of her face. were epic. I really didn't have much criticism at this point, but I did have questions. And that brings us to the Q&A block, where I got the chance to sit down with most of the senior development team, and here is how it went. Spoiler alert, not great. So I remember during Yoshi P's presentation that he said the action game genre had advanced and was now the norm. So my first question to him was, was he implying that JRPGs hadn't advanced in the same way? I could tell immediately that he did not love the phrasing of that question. I could hear him mention the term JRPG over and over again, and I was kind of waiting for the translation from Koji Fox to come back. Koji said, quote, One thing he wants to get across is that when we create games, we don't go into them thinking we are creating JRPGs. We are just creating RPGs. The term JRPG is used by Western media rather than users and media in Japan, end quote. This made a lot of That's so interesting to hear because, like, JRPGs, like, I don't know. Like, I play jrpgs is kind of one of the things i talk about on my channel right obviously it's kind of a theme a lot of the games we play are from japan uh it's regarding pokemon fire emblem um elden ring um my god like let's take a look shin megami tensei soul hackers like uh persona like all these games are from japanese developers and just let's take a look here at my channel i have on the site here Hell, even Resident Evil 4, Capcom, Japanese, FF16, uh, Strangers of Paradise. Yeah, I mean, like, almost everything, even Scarlet Nexus, I want to say, is too, actually, don't quote me on that, um, near. Like, just going back through everything I started uploading videos on this channel, it's, you know, so it's, it's really weird to hear that the term that they don't kind of like the term JRPGs, they just think of it as an RPG, right? And, uh, you know, it's interesting, right? Because JRPGs, I think, the way you, us as Westerners interpret them is just because it's kind of a certain concept or expectation of kind of what the game might be around. Uh, and they talk about this here in a second. Um, regarding the story, the characters, the cutscenes, things like that. And there's just kind of been... An expectation and i think for me personally like it's a good thing right so to hear them talk about they don't want to be referred to as jrpgs they just make rpgs it's kind of interesting because it's like i'm like wow i never would have thought of that like that being kind of like insulting to the point you know so uh it's really really weird to hear especially you know when you think of like jrpgs you think of just good games right at least for me the final fantasy series specifically especially like one through six seven on you know like there's always been like a certain standard it feels like especially seven through ten seven eight nine and ten eight you know is a little mixed reviews right but you know people love seven nine and ten are some of people's favorite rpgs ever even thinking that chrono trigger is probably mine and how beloved that franchise is too or not sorry that not that franchise but that game so it's like really weird to just hear that from especially Yoshi P of all people that that's kind of has a negative connotation to them. A lot of sense, of course, but we discussed a little more because I could tell that he wasn't comfortable with that term. And then he said something really fascinating, quote, this is going to depend on who you ask, but there was a time when this term first appeared 15 years ago, and for us as developers, the first time we heard it, it was like a discriminatory term, as though we were being made fun of for creating these games. And so for some developers, the term JRPG can be something that will maybe trigger bad feelings because of what was in the past. It wasn't a compliment to a lot of developers in Japan. We understand that recently JRPG has better connotations and it's being used as a positive, but we still remember the time when it was being used as a negative, end quote. So yeah, that's kind of like just what I said. Um, it's just really weird to see that because like I said, I think of good things and I've, I don't know why for them it's associated with bad, but it's, I mean, you know, I think of FF7, Think of Persona 5, like now, or the Persona series, the Shin Megami Tensei series. So it's really weird to hear, uh, even like Legends of Dragoon, you know, all these games have been around for a long time that have 
our beloved and um cherished right for a long time ago so even to hear that it's just really weird to think i was so stunned by this because i had never heard this before to me the term jrpg yeah. was sort of as agnostic as arpg or crpg it was a yeah, shorthand descriptor too. that summarized a set of characteristics associated with a certain type of rpg yeah. the way we'd call xenoblade a jrpg but we wouldn't call elden ring a jrpg despite True. the fact that they were both rpgs made in japan but clearly for yoshi p this shorthand had a lot of baggage Quote, I remember seeing something 15 years ago, which was basically a definition of what a JRPG was versus a Western RPG. And it's kind of like Final Fantasy VII, and it has this type of graphics, this length of story, and compartmentalizing what we were creating into a JRPG box. And I took offense to that because that's not how we go into creating. We were going into create an RPG, but to be compartmentalized, we felt that was discriminatory, end quote so fascinating right that is one of the most successful rpg makers of all time working in the company that basically invented the jrpg as we refer to it today exactly saying that the term jrpg was kind of offensive that is like that was such an eye-opening exchange anyway i think this speaks to yoshi p's desire to not have his games be put in narrowly defined boxes final fantasy 14 is a really good example of and from a developer standpoint, that makes perfect sense, right? Because, you know, that is kind of true. That's kind of like what I was saying. When you think of a JRPG, you think of like a certain aspect of storytelling, story focused, uh, certain, you know, most likely turn based combat, all those types of things, you know, or like a lot of times you get with like certain animes in some JRPGs, especially you think about like Persona, the high school protagonist and all these different things. And then you have to defeat a god and those type of things tend to be pretty common in JRPGs. So it makes sense like from a developer standpoint, right? That's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's kind of an insult because like Yoshi P says, it's like you're being defined into this box, right? And it's like, we're, we don't want to be confined to just this. You know, we want to create what we want to create of that with its very unique spin on the MMO RPG formula. Final Fantasy 16 is clearly another with its move to real-time combat. I asked Yoshi P about that move and why he felt it was necessary. Quote, traveling around the world, speaking with fans and media about their image of the franchise, they would always give the same answer, that it's <coughs> turn-based, that it's anime-like, these teenagers saving the world, very JRPG in inverted commas. This was the image for all of Final Fantasy. This was turning off some players because they thought it could only be that, and that was a reason to not get into it. On top of that, you have a generation of new gamers who were raised on first-person shooters and games like Grand Theft Auto, where input is always direct. For those players, the thought of having to wait before you act is kind of a disconnect for that young generation. So with our goal to expand the series and broaden the audience, bring back players, but also welcome new players, we realized that we had to evolve the series and change it up from what people expected." End quote. And I think that's a trend that we've seen more commonly in more recent years, right? The amount of turn-based RPGs has kind of gone down. It's more action-based. And as much as I love turn-based turn RPGs, I'm totally fine with this. I love Final Fantasy VII uh, Remake. I thought it was incredible. Just the adaptation of taking from a turn-based, implementing the enemies, the world, into that type of action RPG elements was really well done. And I think just the kind of faster pace combat as well as more giving you kind of a little bit more options, removing a little bit of the strategy side effects, uh, sorry, sorry, the strategy side to the elements of kind of turn based and kind of focusing more on like quick reaction and being able to put together combos, things like that is kind of more in line with kind of what's popular, what's kind of the trend at the moment. Um, who's to say that we might not go back to turn base or some sort of variation of that in the future, but for the time being, you know, uh, I think this is totally fine just to kind of go in this direction. It's worked well. I don't know anybody who doesn't like it. There's still a turn base RPG. So if that is kind of your preference, you know, there's still that out there. So it's not like anybody's losing from this. Again, I found this so interesting to know that Grand Theft Auto has directly influenced Final Fantasy 16. But also because it implies that he doesn't think the innovations present in Final Fantasy VII were enough to shift people's perceptions of what this franchise is or could be. My final question to him was, what would you like people to say about this game five years from now, both as a standalone experience and as part of the Final Fantasy franchise? Quote, what I want is for players to say, 
wow, that it blew them away. Wow can be perceived in different ways. Wow because of story. Wow because of lots of crazy boss battles. Wow because whoever made this must have been out of their minds. What we want is for players to have that sense of wow. As for its place within the franchise, hopefully through Final Fantasy 16, we can kind of regain that sense of the Final Fantasy series is a must buy. You must check this out something that we don't have now and we can return to the idea that when a final fantasy comes out it is something that we must play end quote i thought that was fascinating because personally i think Sorry. final fantasy is a must play especially after 7 remake I agree obviously yoshi p doesn't agree and i think a lot of the big bold plays that we're seeing here in 16 can be explained by this hunger that yoshi p has he doesn't see Final Fantasy as the preeminent RPG franchise with a lot of incumbency, something guaranteed success or entitled to your dollars or playtime. He sees it as something kind of aging, fossilized in the minds of players, a little bit outdated compared to contemporary offerings. And he's not happy with that. That is why there are no sacred cows, whether it's the narrative tone or the technology they're using or gameplay. Every you know, I think it's safe to say in regards to the Final Fantasy main titles, that is understandable right uh i think we have been kind of going backwards from 10 on you know 11 came out i didn't really play it around that time since i was in high school i didn't play as so much games from my time during high school through college the games i really played was mostly call of duty things like that a few others wow but the the idea of the, like the main final fantasy titles from like 12 on has kind of just hasn't been as popular and that's not to say they're not as bad games they're sorry that's not to say that they're bad games or they're not as good as sorry that's it and that's not to say that they're bad games but it feels like they didn't have the shine or the luster that special that special element to it that really set seven eight nine ten apart making those some of the most beloved games in the entire final fantasy franchise so you know 15 i think did a lot of things right but there was still a lot of room for improvement i think that's kind of the consensus on that game as well so with all the news information everything we've been getting about 16 you know the hype is starting to build and we're kind of seeing that like i all this entire video we put together me watching these like it looks incredible i think it will be a very good game i will be shocked if it is not um it just looks so good so polished aesthetics final fantasy should be story driven it has a 11 hours of cutscenes in it that has been confirmed which is insane uh so there's a story is going to be a big part of it all of the icons the massive summons just look so good i don't think any of them look bad at all just what this is playing up to be i think you know People, there's a reason there's so much excitement, I think, for this game, right? Is because people think we're going back to that prime Final Fantasy era from like 6, 7, 9, and 10. So, and I hope that definitely is the case with 16 here. Everything is on the table for Yoshi P and his team. Will long standing fans of the Final Fantasy franchise agree with his assessment and his interventions? That remains to be seen. But for me personally, I am more than impressed with what I've seen and more than willing to just hop on that roller coaster and see what's in store. I am quietly confident that it's going to be a very good ride. I am as well. While I was in Japan, I... All right, uh, this is going to be an ad. I think he had it at the very beginning of the video as well. So I think that's going to be it for all this content. We've got a pretty good idea of everything that's going to be here getting added all from that two hour window that these guys got access to um if there is anything additional to it i am going to just add that as its own separate video uh i think this is going to be the last part here for the final fantasy 16 uh preview uh mega content release that we've gotten here from uh from yesterday so i cannot wait i'm super excited uh tons to hear to discuss amongst all the videos we've watched reacted to I'm really excited for this game. If that wasn't obvious already, it looks so, so good. So incredible. The aesthetics, the story, the characters, the voice acting, the big ass fights, the combat, even the items, the talents, like it all looks really good. And I cannot wait. Let me know down below in the comments what you guys are most excited for or some of the new pieces of 
information that we got that really sticks out to you so uh with that i hope you guys enjoy i hope to see you guys in the next one as well peace deuces see ya